Hey everybody, it's Dr. Rick. On my way into the office and I decided to shoot a couple of videos. The first one was about personal development. Uh, this one is going to be more on a community level. Um, over the years, I have talked to you about everything from serial force displacement, miseducation of our youth, mass incarceration of our... <coughs> <laughs> of our men <coughs> the violence in our community uh, domestic violence even more sensitive topics like incest and the silent condemnation that goes along with it uh, I have used years and years of research to develop a keen awareness and understanding of the things that work against us, the systems, and even some of the behaviors that we exhibit that we refer to as being cultural, when actually they are the fallout behavior of trauma, of systemic uh, influence, and so much more. Um, before I move forward, I want to remind you that we're in the middle of a fundraiser so that we can expand our reach, uh, so that we can take programs like Black Men Lead and literally start to touch young black males at a very early age uh, across the nation through a network with a universal uh, program, a universal rite of passage, a clear development of an idea and understanding of what a black man is. Uh, a month or so ago, I did a series called The Five Ps of Manhood. The, the goal was to come up with a universal idea or scope or measuring tool of what black manhood should look like. And I think one of the problems that we have had over the last 30 years is how we define manhood. Everybody has their own idea. You know, to one person is, can he pay the bills? On another person is, how fine he is. Another person is, how he puts it down in the bedroom. Uh, his career path, how popular is he? How assertive is he? You know, how smooth is he? Uh, there are all these different uh, measuring uh, mechanisms for manhood. And so men are running around chasing ideals instead of living by principles and natural presets that should govern their behavior. And this has become the default, you know. Everybody's clucking and flapping their wings like Bantam roosters uh, because they're doing something that society says makes them a man, but the true nature is our communities are failing far too much for any of us to be clucking and, and flapping our wings. Uh, our children are at the mercy of an education system that is absolutely horrible and targeting specifically young black men. Um, our uh, prison system is literally functioning off of the backs of black men. We make up a significant minority in the population of black men specifically, and yet we make up 40, nearly 40% 40 of the male population in prison, the majority. There are more black men in American prisons than there are any other race, including white men, while white men make up a large majority of the population and statistics show are more likely to be criminal minded. Now, the type of crimes they commit and where they commit them may be different, but uh, they're more likely to have drugs on them than black men. But who are we seeing getting the majority of the drug cases? We can go on and on and on about the system, but the problem I see isn't the system. The problem I see is the enemy within. I've told you guys about this before, that one of my favorite quotes is the African proverb, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. And to me, that's one of the biggest problems we have is the enemy on the inside. We still, are, you know how I, I have women uh, that are clients, that literally are paying clients that I've had, some of them for a couple of years, um, uh, that are in their 60s. Not just one, I said women that are in their 60s that are still struggling with incest from their childhood. I've got a, an increasing influx of young black males under the age of 25 suffering from depression, suicidal ideation, uh, a lack of 
fulfilling uh, place, alienation in the academic process. I could go on that are coming uh, and their parents predominantly are hoping that we can right the ship, that we can get things going. But I'm also serving as an advocate because in many instances, it's the school that is creating the problem. I've got multiple, I've been doing, doing that for years. I mean, I've gone toe to toe with the Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, independent school system, uh, which is under fire now, just fired its uh, superintendent who was a black person who was, at the time I was doing it, an assistant. And he became the superintendent after uh, I had walked away from the battle and we had gained some, what I thought was ground, but obviously it went backwards. Well, he was recently fired. I've done that. I've done it on the university level. This isn't some new game to me. I, I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm at war with a system that's hurting our kids, but what I see in the process is that we're failing them on the front end. What are we teaching them when they're three, four, or five years old? It's a game now. We put put the phone in their hand and we let them watch YouTube and and, and, and Instagram and, and and all these other things and we think it's cute and you know look they can he can work the phone already but what is he taking in when you're not watching and even as he grows older what are you allowing how much screen time is the kid getting versus face to face time with the parent how much screen time is he getting versus face to face time with the book. I'm, I'm trying to get this across that we've got to change. We've got to change. We've got to do something different. We've got to raise the standard. We've got to go harder on how we're going to approach what we do to our children. That's why I'm so passionate about Black Man Lead. Why? Because it's a program designed to properly socialize young black males into black manhood. A major gap that we're dealing with. Now, we got 1.5 missing black men for whatever reason. Uh, granted, a great deal of them are incarcerated. Uh, another great deal of them have checked out for whatever reason. That can't be an excuse for where we're at right now. That means we need to double down. We need to do better of rearing back black men. Uh, you heard me say this uh, a lot recently, uh, Frederick Douglass, it's easier to build strong black children than it is to heal broken men. I keep telling people, we're gonna win the battle in the minds of our children, but we, we are losing that war majorly right now. You can't have a device created by your uh, uh, your enemy or the opposition and the programming provided by the enemy of the opposition and then expose your child to it and think that your child is going to come out in the system and win when it was designed as a distraction when it was designed to be a mentally mind controlling behavior controlling mechanism uh, even things we create hip hop and R&B that's controlled by someone outside of the spectrum. Hip hop was ours at one point. It was a new language. It was a it was a response to Cointel Pro. If you want to really understand hip hop, it was a response to Cointel Pro and the disruption and destruction or breaking down and disbanding of the Black Nationalist Party and the Black Panther Party. It was a new way of talking and introducing people into the power of blackness, into creating black unity, using a newly developed and evolving vocabulary or vernacular that did not uh, fit the norm. It was away from the norm. We call stuff dope, death. Uh, when we say it bad, it means good, you know. It, it, it just, you know, uh, a lot of different things that we've evolved and we, we kept the monikers going but we lost control of the mechanism they saw it was money in it they also saw how it was empowered black when you had x clan and diggable planets and all of these cats that was you know uh gangs all these cats that was spitting knowledge pop we, we, we want to, we remember the hardcore shit Pop did, but we, we don't want to remember how he was spending some socially conscious stuff on a regular. And then, I mean, just go back and look at, you know, I mean, a whole, the whole group, look at all the MCs that were in self-destruction and think about their, um, uh, the, the, their body of work. And you'll find a lot of positive stuff, a lot of fun stuff, a lot of dance floor stuff, but a lot of positive stuff. But it got disrupted, it got interrupted, it got stolen. It got hijacked. 
they start infiltrating Molly's and Percocets, the dope game, the misogyny, the disrespect of black women made it mainstream, made it cool to the point that the term simp rolls back up in the vernacular. And now men who treat women with high regard and respect and love and care are now referred to as simps, which is the downplay of the word pimp. We didn't see it coming, but it came. We didn't do anything about it. We thought it was cool. Man, that white dude show can rap, but you know, hey man, this record label, this record label, I'm signing with this record label. We didn't look at the threat. And then we can sit up and talk about all of the kids that are now signing these record deals back from 20 years ago up to now and uh, what they're signing on and, and how they are signing their lives away. But we didn't give them any options or alternatives if they want to. You can't take a kid that grew up in poverty and tell them to turn down a $500,000, $500, million advance. Especially when you have not inculcated into their minds who they are. When you have not properly socialized them, when you have not prepared them to go out into the world and be who they were designed to be, to protect women, to protect children, to protect the elderly, to own their own businesses, to create their own avenues and opportunities and not beg the opposition for a chance or an opportunity, to go out and make things happen. That's what that's how hip hop got started. But look what look at look look at where it's gone. Uh, not only did we lose the positive message, we lost the drive for skill and talent. Everything was hidden behind the beat. The, the, the talent became the producers. And the producers were so good at putting down tracks that they hid the lack of skill and creativity from the artists. So then it became, we can find anybody that we can market and we can put a, put a mic in their hand and we can make them a gold or maybe even a, a platinum recording artist. The real talent went underground. The real talent set back on the back burner because they were trying to kill them at the same time. I want you to understand that what we do in the next five years is going to be pivotal in what our, the, live, the type of lives our grandchildren and great-grandchildren live. You can, you can say I'm over exaggerating, I'm understating. If we don't do something in the next five years, and I don't mean start something five years from now, I mean the next five years, the day moving forward, the next five years are pivotal. What are we gonna be doing? What are we gonna be building? How are we gonna move with our kids? What are we gonna pay? Are we gonna sacrifice another generation to this bull crap and expect them to uh, expand and explode? Even the ones that become successful by uh, society standards, tend to serve the system more than they serve us. That's because we didn't do what we were supposed to do in the beginning on the front end. So I'm challenging everybody. It's time to step up. It's, stop to, it's time to stop sitting around and thinking and hoping and praying and begging and all this other stuff. You want something in life, you got to go out and get it. You got to make it happen. That's no difference than what we're facing as a race. We're going to have to go out and make it happen. We're going to have to stop thinking that we can guilt them, that we can convince them, that we can move. We are going to have to stand up and do the things we need to do for ourselves. We're going to have to prepare our kids to go out to this world and kill. And I don't mean that in the sense of killing people. I mean, kill their dreams. Knock it out the park. I mean, go get whatever it is and do it with a way that supports and builds and grows the black community. You, you know, uh, when J. Edgar Hoover was asked what the greatest threat to national security is for the United States of America, his response was black unity. Why do you think that was his control? Why do you think he went to such great lengths to disband the black nationalist party and the black panther party? Why was that so much? Because he understood the power. You know, the black panthers was doing wick. They were feeding people in the community. They was building in the community. It wasn't just about packing guns. It was about protecting the community. It was about giving kids something to look forward to. It was about, you know, uh, making sure there were no hungry bellies, empty bellies. It was about education. That, that was really a movement going on. Scared the hell out of them. That we can't have, the one thing we cannot have is an educated black man willing to move on behalf of black people. 
And that's what we're going to have to create. And I don't mean educated by their term, by, by, by their status. I mean educated with a holistic understanding of who they are, starting with a true identity in, uh, anchored in blackness. We have so much that we need to do. I'm getting to the office and I gotta immediately run here and jump on this, uh, the teacher's podcast today. So I just wanted to drop that on you. Show some love, show some support for, support for the work we're doing. Give, support, donate. The link to uh, support us is gonna be in the description box. And you can also give through the organization's cash app handle. On that note, I am going to get out of here. You guys have an unbelievable